was commanded and as C.T. lived to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly. We now turn this service over to you, Lord. We submit to your will and your way. Your thoughts are higher and your ways are higher. It is in the sweet, precious name of Jesus that we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. I'd like to now call to the podium uh, Reverend Damon Williams, the pastor of Providence Missionary Baptist Church. Amen, Reverend Vivian, thank you for your leadership and worship. To the C.T. Vivian family who is here this morning, let me welcome you and say good morning. To the friends of Dr. Vivian, let me say welcome and good morning. And to brothers and sisters all around the world who are streaming with us to honor this great man, allow me to say welcome and good morning. My name is the Reverend Damon P. Williams and I am humbled and honored to serve as the senior pastor here at Providence Missionary Baptist Church. And I want you to know we have come to worship God this morning and the great things that God has done through this amazing man, this extraordinary man, the Reverend Dr. C.T. Vivian. Friends, what you are about to experience is the continuation, not the culmination of a great life lived for the Lord. We're gonna experience C.T.'s own words, hear from his own friends and his own family, and most importantly, receive his great wisdom that the legacy of his life will be with us forever. As we worship, we will honor the fact that there are children here who have lost their father. There are grandchildren who have lost their granddad. And there's a family here who has lost its patriarch. And so we will support and honor this family in love and in worship. Following the CDC's guidelines and under the amazing leadership of our honorable mayor, the honorable Keisha Lance Bottoms, we will socially distance by family we will keep our mask on at all times unless you are speaking, and we will use hand sanitizer liberally. But most importantly, I want you to know that you are in a worship experience to thank God for what the Lord has done. We are blessed today that the daughter-in-law of Dr. C.T. Vivian, the Reverend Diana Jo Vivian, is here to lead us in worship as our liturgist. And so, this is your call to worship. Reverend Vivian, the service is in your hands. Thank you, Reverend Williams. Your words were encouraging, inspiring, and most certainly needed. As a family member, I can say it touched me, and I am confident it touched the hearts of our family. I would be remiss if I did not say this right now. I want to thank Reverend Williams and the Providence family for all that they did in these trying times to make this service happen. You all have no idea what goes on beyond this, behind the scenes, but this man took time out of his personal life, even during a time of loss for him, to be here for us. And so we are forever grateful and ever thankful for you and the Providence family. Now, for those of you who are following along in the order of service, we will now have the reading of the Holy Scriptures, beginning with the Old Testament, Ecclesiastes 3, verses 1 through 8, and that will be read by Tamu al-Islam, who is a cousin, followed by the reading of the New Testament, Matthew chapter 5, verses 41 through 48, and that will be read by Carlton Morse, son-in-law. Um, the scripture reading will be followed with the solo, The Lord's Prayer, by Karen Lowry. And then a compilation video of some of CT's most notable works entitled, It's in the Action. We will conclude this section with personal reflections. Now, how many of you know if we allowed every person that has a close relationship with CT to come up to this podium and speak, that we would be here until this time next week. Would you, can I get an amen? amen. Yeah, y'all know I'm telling the truth. But with that in mind, the family asked two of CT's closest friends, 
Don Rivers and George Andrews to provide a window into what it's like to be friended by C.T. Vivian. So we will begin with scripture. Um, and with that, Everything has its time. For everything, there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. A time to be born, a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal a time to break down, and a time to build up. A time to weep, and a time to laugh. A time to mourn, and a time to dance. A time to throw away stones, and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to seek and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate, a time for war, and a time for peace. And if someone in authority compels you into service for a mile, go with him two miles. Give to one asking you, and do not turn away from one who wants to borrow from you. You heard that it was said, you must love your neighbor and hate your enemy. However, I say to you, continue to love your enemies and to pray for those who persecute you so that you may prove yourselves sons of your Father who is in the heavens since he makes his sun rise on both the wicked and the good and makes it rain on both the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those loving you, what reward do you have? Are you not also the tax collectors doing the same thing? And if you greet your brothers only, what extraordinary thing are you doing? Are you not also the people of the nations doing the same thing? You must accordingly be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. The word of the Lord.
Teachers had participated, I remember vividly on that day when I saw my teachers marching with me, you know, just for the right to vote. And it was, teachers then was somewhat like up in the upper class, you know. People look up to teachers then and look up to preachers. They were somewhat like leaders for us back then. Then the undertakers got a group and they marched. The beauticians got a group, they marched. Everybody marched after teachers marched because teachers had more influence than they ever dreamed in the community. And we want you to know, gentlemen, that every one of you, see, we know your badge numbers, we know your names. In mid-February, Reverend C.T. Vivian, an SCLC organizer, confronted Sheriff Clark and his deputies on the courthouse steps. But believe me, there were those that followed Hitler, like you blindly follow this Sheriff Clark, who didn't think their day would come. But they also were pulled into the courtrooms and they were also given their death sentences. You are not this bad a racist, but you're a racist in the same way that Hitler was a racist. And you're blindly following a man that's leading you down a road that's gonna bring you into federal court. Now, well, I am representing people in Dallas County, and I have that right to do so. Now, and as I represent them, and they can speak for themselves, is what I'm saying true? Yeah. Is it what you think and what you believe? Yeah. Boy, this is not a local problem, gentlemen. This is a national problem. You can't keep anyone in the United States from voting without hurting the rights of all other citizens. Democracy's built on this. This is why every man has the right to vote, regardless. And he started shouting at me that I was a Hitler, I was a brute, that I was a Nazi. I don't remember all everything he called me. And I did lose my temper then. And we have come I don't rem remember even hitting him, but I f went to the doctor and got an x-ray and found out I had a linear fracture and a finger on my left hand. With Jim Clark, it was a clear engagement between the forces of movement and the forces of the structure that would destroy movement. It was a clear engagement between those who wished the fullness of their personalities to be met and those that would destroy us physically and psychologically. You do not walk away from that. This is what movement meant. Movement meant that finally we were encountering on a mass scale the evil that had been destroying us on a mass scale. You do not walk away from that. You continue to answer it. If we're wrong, why don't you arrest us? Why don't you get out in front of the camera and go on? It's a general matter of being from the camera. It's a matter of facing it. your sheriff and face. facing your judge. We're willing to be beaten for democracy. And you misuse democracy in the street. You beat people bloody in order 
time that they will not have the privilege to vote. You beat me in the side and then hide your blows. I don't want you to leave. We have come to register to vote. I'm here to tell you tonight that the businessmen, the mayor of this city, the police commissioner of this city, and everybody in the white power structure of this city must take a responsibility for everything that Jim Clark does in this community. The force of southern people shall break down segregation and admit the Negro race into our theaters, into our spring pools, into our... Strom Thurmond's 1948 presidential run on a segregationist platform was unsuccessful. But it wasn't until 1971 that the Supreme Court finally outlawed segregated pools and beaches, 17 years after the integration of American schools. The effort to integrate beaches and pools intensified here in 1964 in the former slave trading port of St. Augustine, Florida, when a civil rights leader literally drew a new line in the sand and asked former state attorney Dan Warren for the protection of the law. He was wearing a bathing suit. He said, well, I want to go swimming. And I said, well, be my guest. You're probably a dart. And he said, well, you don't understand, Mr. Warren. Every time we want to go swimming, at the public beach. The Klan uh, interferes with us, and they beat us up. Lunch counter sit-ins turned into beach wade-ins, and a special force of state troopers was sent in to keep segregationists from pummeling the protesters. They formed two lines, waded out in the ocean in full uniform. Demonstrators came in. Well, the Klan was waiting, and they had pickup trucks parked on the beach, and, and in the trunks and in the beds, the trucks had surveyor stakes and they'd grab the survey stakes and try to break through that line. What did swimming represent to segregationists that created such hostility? Fear. Of what? Fear against going and uh, sharing the same water with blacks. 44% of black children live under the poverty level right now. All right? 36% of black families live under the poverty level, and that's the highest it's ever been since they've been keeping figures on us. Now, let's say it this way. Let's say it, it is uh, too much and you drop out or are pushed out, is what we call it, being pushed out. Then 30% of a white dropout are unemployed, but 71.4% of black dropouts are unemployed. If you're a black male, uh, the study said that we may see a generation of young black men who've never had a study job. Even if you get to college, uh, uh, a black man with a college education will make slightly less in a lifetime than a white man with a high school education. But let me huh? stop. Let me stop, stop you, Dr. Vivian, because I know that there are a number of people listening to this show, and no doubt those of you in the seminar who say, "Well, that is not my fault." and the opportunities have been given, and so we need to discuss why those statistics are the way they are. Yeah, and let's deal with that as the principle. Okay. What, what America doesn't deal with, and if you've got in half of our confrontations there, is that what white America doesn't deal with when it comes to blacks is cause and effect. Yeah. They say blacks are like this, but they never deal with why we're like that right is that that's why I turn and say are blacks treated the same in the society and of course every white person no we're not and but the what they don't realize Oprah is the what that actually does the depth of it is that their mistreatment their choosing not to accept blacks creates a depth of suffering and death in fact, there is nothing in this society. It sort of it starts a chain that, that never gets that, broken. That's a, in yeah. fact, chain is the good word because it's a cycle. Right. Everything cycle. works on everything else. In fact, racism destroys more people psychologically and physically than any other factor in American society. It's in the action, folks. Without a shadow of a doubt, I love 
that video. It speaks to the heart of who the Reverend Dr. C.T. Vivian is. You know, there's a scripture that we all know, that God did not give us a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. I always say fear doesn't leave us. We leave it with every step we take. And it is evident in that video that Dr. Vivian was not afraid. He was a man of courage and he was a man of action. If this does not inspire you, I don't know what will. I want to take a step back and thank uh, Karen Lowry for her beautiful rendition of the Lord's Prayer. I was truly blessed by it. And to know that she herself suffered a loss this year of her own father, the Reverend Joe Lowry, and for her to take time to be here for our family is truly amazing. And it is a testimony of the closeness of the civil rights families. And so Karen, I did not get to say it immediately after you finished, but I wanna tell you, thank you personally. You truly blessed us, truly blessed us. I also wanna make one addition to the um, personal reflections. Please forgive my error, but I left off the name David McCord. So David McCord will be the last person who spoke, but I kind of think that it was a blessing of the Lord that I forgot the name because there's just one small reminder I need to give to the people who are speaking. You have two minutes. Two, maybe three. Now I did speak with um, the current pastor and the former pastor of this church and they advised me that when they built Providence, that they built a trap door that's right beneath my feet. And that indeed, if people go longer than they ought, there's gonna be a nice little playing of the organ as we have right now. When you hear that, that means wrap it up. If you fail to oblige, you understand you then fall. You fail, you fall. And with that, I wanna to welcome to the podium Don Rivers. I just like to say that there's so many people that are praying for me and the family and it is appreciated. Dr. Vivian was more than just a friend. He was my heart, he was my soul. I would not be the person that I am today if it was not for Dr. Vivian. And I'm not saying that I'm all that, but I met Dr. Vivian when I was 21 years old. I went to work for him at Shaw University. He was the dean of the Divinity School and I was the audio director for Seminary Without Walls. Um, I'm 67 years old now and I've never met anyone like Dr. Vivian. He was the most courageous, no nonsense, giving, loving person that I've ever met. He had principles that I attempt to live by on a daily basis, which is truth, ethics, justice, and love. He never met a stranger. He had no barriers. I remember working at Shaw with Dr. Vivian. We were going to a meeting and I was driving him and it was pouring down rain outside. And we came to a stop sign and in the crosswalk, this old gentleman, this old man, he looked to be homeless. Um, and Dr. Vivian just started crying put his head in his hand, and I said, Dr. Vivian, what, what's wrong, what's wrong? He raised his head, had tears running down his face, and said, I wonder what brought this man to this point in his life. 
he was such a gentle man, special person. I mean, he loved everyone, everyone, no matter the color, no matter the status, any of that. But also, he was a very strong man. I remember um, that Denise, Deanna Joe, they contacted me and said, listen, um, the family wants you to handle Dr. Vivian's business as far as the contracts, negotiating, and traveling with him. Uh, I tell you, it was not easy because Dr. Vivian is not just a simple, easy man. He's a very stern, tough man, but he's a loving man. And he's never been about the money. He's never been about fame. He has always been about people, the community, serving. He lived a life of unselfishness and has never looked for or wanted any recognition. He truly lived by the Greek word agape, which means giving unselfishly without looking for anything in return. I would not have traveled all across the country abroad and met all the beautiful and spiritual people that I have met if it was not for me being Dr. Vivian's humble servant and friend. The world is a better place because of you, Dr. Vivian. <laughs> and I love you so much. And I'm going to miss you tremendously. Good morning. First of all, let me say to the family, thank you for this honor. What a privilege for me to be here to make some remarks from this great soldier of the Lord. But before I do that, I have to recognize Octavia Vivian, his wife. Can't do it without recognizing her. Dr. Vivian taught me that a partnership of marriage it's like riding a bicycle. You got two wheels. That front wheel is the guiding wheel that, that, that guides you to your mission. That back wheel is the drive. It drives you. And a bicycle doesn't work unless you have that drive in the back. So Octavia was that driver for Dr. C.T. Vivian. Once in a lifetime, God sends to the world a giant among men a person who is soft-spoken but fully equipped with the tools to go about his life mission with vigor and fortitude that places him in an elite class of world leaders. That man was Reverend Dr. C.T. Vivian. What was the mission, you ask? We all know that he walked shoulders to shoulders with the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. and was a trusted friend and advisor as well as a person with extraordinary talents to encourage and to inspire. We all know how he embraced a young man from Troy, Alabama, the son of a sharecropper named John Lewis. We all know he encouraged and he supported this young student's perspective of nonviolence in terms of being disciplined as a young man, no matter how difficult the road to freedom might be. C.T. is legendary for his compassion to motivate leaders from the political, religious, and business community. His only question to leaders was, are you willing, are you willing to serve by giving your full measure to your mission? The Reverend Dr. Durley reminds me of C.T. Vivian's mission. One day I noticed he was preaching like there was no tomorrow at a little small church 
and he's a big man, sweating and kicking and hollering, trying to get people into heaven. And I asked afterwards, I said, Dr. Durley, there was only 20 people in this congregation, and half of them were deacons. Why were you preaching so hard? Then he shared with me, when you have your mission to preach, Dr. Viv Dr. Vivian and other leaders inspired upon me, you give your full measure. You might not remember that, but you told me you give your full measure. Then there was a young man that wanted to start a community bank. Had all kinds of struggles. Then one day a voice called and said, look, come over. My wife and I would like to talk to you. My wife and I would like to talk to you. Well, CT joined the parade of organizers to start Capital City Bank, but it was a big struggle. And I later asked him, I said, why was it such a struggle, CT? Now, this is a man that's a prophet from God. I'm convinced CT is a prophet. You see, I had over 18 years of banking experience and senior management with some of the largest banks in the world. And I had the most dynamic business plan, but yet and still, it was very difficult for me to start this institution. And I wanted to know why, why? He answered in a calm and assuring voice. If you had succeeded according to your business plan, then you would have believed that it was you. But by you having to struggle, and struggle, you now know that it was only by the grace of God. It was only by the grace of God. <laughs> Finally, after all the employees had been hired and the building fully renovated and we were now ready to open, I felt the weight of the world on my shoulders, Mel Bottom, and I know you feel this way sometimes. You have to. I thought, maybe I'm not ready. Maybe I needed more training. And I ran the question by CT. He didn't say much that day, but later on he brought by my house a framed picture of a burning bush. And the capture in the picture read, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelite out of Egypt? And God said, and it stopped right there. And I thought about it, and God said, CT knew that you, the individual with the mission, is the you that has to lead if we are going to eliminate injustice in this country. CT knew that it was you if we were going to eliminate economic imperity in this country. CT knew it's you that must lead if you are sick and tired of young black men being killed unmercifully in this country. CT knew that if black lives really matter, then it is you, it is you that must lead. I have known CT Vivian practically all my life, and I have never heard the man say one discouraging word, one discouraging word about anybody, anybody, Reverend Williams, not one discouraging word. So after a board meeting, after we've been kicked around and knocked around, and C.T. didn't even say anything, he was the chairman of the board. I said, C.T., what, what gives with this? What gives with this? And he answered by saying that there's only one perfect person, and that was Jesus Christ. Therefore, I treat people the way that I want them to treat me. And I don't know if this was one of his cliches or a cliche he got from an old Baptist preacher. But the man said, be patient with God because he's not finished with me yet. Be patient with God because he's not finished with me yet. So CT want us not to be so 
readily to judge somebody and to criticize, but be patient because God is not finished with that person yet. So I thank CT for being my friend, being my leader, being my partner in banking. May God bless him, and may God bless the family. Oh, by the way, I'd be remiss. I got to tell you something else. I brought a resolution for C.T. Vision because C.T. was a investor, too, and his daughter's looking at me straight in the eye, and she told me a long time ago, if you let my dad and make one more investment, you're going to pay for it, George. You're going to pay for it. C.T. would invest in gold mines in South Africa, T-shirt stands for the Olympics. You name it, he would invest in it. But he made one great investment. He, in, he invests in black banking. And I have a resolution here that I will present to the family later on. And I know my three minutes almost up. <laughs> but it simply says, it simply says, okay, I won't read it. Thank you. But I'll make sure the family gets it afterwards. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. All right. I really want to thank the Vivian family for their friendship all these years. And uh, Don, a long, long time, brother. A long time. When I think of CT, I, you know, I think of that. I always hoped I heard some corny joke or some pun, knowing that when I got there, if I told it, I would get that laugh and smile for a reward. So it made my day. You know, C.T. and Octavia, what a love story. I can remember when people would ask C.T. about his book, and I remember him responding, you know, but the wife's book sold more than mine. <laughs> but, and I remember, and I, let me be brief about this, back in the 80s, the Georgia Legislative uh, Caucus had wanted to give CT a, a secret or surprise award at some venue. And uh, CT worked out and got him there. And you, what did CT do? He turned his tribute into a tribute to Octavia. And I watched every woman in that room body posture move and lean into his words. When he, when he talked about how all the times that he was away and gone during movement, that, that she, she kept all the resentment and did nothing but engender love for him from his joy. And that, that was CT. You know, but books, books, books. By luck or serendipity, I was in his life when CT began collecting, and I was transitioning from collector to dealer. During those early years, I admit he kept my lights on a couple of times, if not more. But the real reward was to watch him look through every book of newfound, every box of newfound books that I took to his house. They were immediately his new friends. Collectors, there are all kinds of them, but there is a hierarchy. And CT sits at the top. He is the collector for whom the book is a tactile experience of what he loves and values. The book is not an object, it's an intimate relationship. His library is not a room for books. It's a place of rejuvenation, contemplation, and sanctuary. 
at a recent board meeting for CT and Octavia Vivian's library, my dear friend looked to me and said, I remember when we met. It seems to me from a friend and a hero, I couldn't ask for more. Our friendship had bonded over a love of history, a great deal of which he made, and at that time a love for the writings and poetry of Langston Hughes. I don't do spoken word very much anymore, but this one for CT. Hold fast to dreams, for when dreams die, life is a broken winged bird that cannot fly. Hold fast to dreams, for when dreams go, life is a barren field frozen with snow. For me, CT was a dream keeper, always holding fast for dreams of a better world. Thank you to David and to Don, and to you also, Reverend George, wherever you may have gotten away to. I think you missed your calling, sir. Thank you. <laughs> that truly blessed us. We all know CT, but to call him friend is a different seat to sit in. So we appreciate you sharing your experiences about CT with us. I greatly appreciate the mentioning of my dear mother-in-law, Octavia Vivian. She truly was a jewel, a precious woman. You think CT was humble. She was humble. And I think we all miss her and are thinking of her fondly as well as we pay tribute to CT. You know, to say CT was larger than life truly is an understatement. And I believe with all of my heart at the moment that Octavia, his beautiful wife, met him, she knew he would never just belong to her. That he would always belong to the people. He would belong to the world. You see, his work, his calling, his anointing was just too great to exist in a vacuum. We're grateful for her willingness to share him. We're grateful for his children's willingness to share him. At this time, we will show the video tributes from those who knew C.T. well, his peers, his co-laborers in the movement, and those who have used their global platform to amplify the voices of activists seeking justice for all of us. The first video that you will see will be a tribute from Hank Aaron and Billy Aaron, from Bernard Lafayette, Ambassador Andrew Young, and Henrietta Antonin. Well, CT and I don't go back as far as the rest of them, like Andy and some of them. Uh, I've been knowing CT for a long time. I got to, I got to love him, really, not know him. I loved him for what he stood for and what he did and the things that he did. And uh, I just, I, I just. I, I don't know, you know, uh, sometimes you, 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 you wonder what care these civil rights guys own, you know, really. All, and I am so blessed to be part of them, blessed to know them, really. As I discovered him, his background and all, it just gave me a tremendous appreciation for the man and the work that he was doing. He continued to labor in the vineyard until his death. So I guess you could say, um, I just felt that it was his destiny. He was destined to become the kind of human being that he was, which was so warm and unassuming. He never stepped out there to try to get in front of the line. He was always working to plan and implement the plan. C.T. Vivian had a, a rhythm uh, to his message. And his rhythm was really like music. And 
as he continued to make uh, his points, he always went in depth. That was the intellectual part of it. You could always draw from what he had to say, okay? Not just a repetition of, say, verses, but he had a tone to it. And I would describe his preaching as an echo from heaven. Well, he was so uh, in, enthralled in the readings and books and that sort of thing. You know, he had about easily 3,000 books or more, you know, it could be six. And um, so, yes, I do remember uh, the, the writings and that sort of thing. And his wife, Octavia, she was very much involved as a, you know, might say a librarian almost because she would, and it did a very uh, enormous collection, you know, of books and stuff. I was so close to CT as I was to Martin Luther King. And I don't know that I'll ever be lonely uh, for the memories and the presence of my brother's uh, like C.T. Vivian, uh, will always be with me. He was always a pastor. He was always a preacher and a good one. And his motivation was always spiritual. He didn't want attention. He didn't want money. He only wanted to do God's will and bring out the best in these United States of America and its people regardless of their race, creed, color, or national origin. He was always very physical fitness oriented. I, I, I say my knees are bad, and his knees held up all the way for 96 years uh, because he used to go over to Morris Brown and run up the steps of the, sta of the stadium and walk down and then run up again to stay in shape. And well, he and Jimmy Carter are the only people I know that remain the same weight they were in college uh, right on into the last days of their life. Uh, he never gained a pound and he never lost his physical fitness. And he never lost his mental fitness, even, even in these last days when I, a week or so ago when I talked to him, his voice was weak but his thoughts were clear. When I think of our young men, how C.T. Vivian wants to frame our young men and give them the foundation, I'd like for them to think about the life of Dr. C.T. Vivian, how he carried himself. But one of the other things I think about Dr. Vivian, you know, if you want to know something about a man, watch how he treats his wife. He had the utmost respect. He showed so, he showed so much love for Octavia. And I could hear him every day saying, I've got to go see the wife when his wife was sick. He was going every day. I don't care where he was. He had to go to see the wife. He took care of his wife. And he loved her. He treasured her. And that just meant so much to me, to look around and see one of our men, a brother, who respect and love their wife and treasure their wife the way he did. It was just, just incredible, and I just admired it so much. He's the epitome of a gentleman. And of course, we all know he's the quiet warrior, the most humble person that you could possibly meet. If all young men could be a C.T. Vivian, just think of where this world would be today. Definitely worth applause, mighty man. We're going to take a look at the next video. It is from uh, Vice President Joe Biden. Um, I think his remarks will speak for themselves. I'm so honored to be a part of this celebration of Reverend Vivian's long life of purpose and meaning. To the family, from his children to his great, great, great grandchildren, thank you sincerely for allowing me to join you today. I was an admirer. It is not easy to grieve in public. I know from experience. 
It's not easy to lose a loved one who means so much to so many, but who meant the most to all of you. And C.T. was truly a remarkable man, a man whose physical courage was exceeded only by his moral courage, whose capacity for love overwhelmed incredible hatreds, and whose faith in the power of nine violence helped forever change our nation. The number of times he faced down being drowned, being beaten, being reviled, only to stand up straight as a ramrod, bloodied but unbent, and declare the truth that he saw so clearly. Quote, you cannot turn your back on the idea of justice, end of quote. You know, it's hard for most people to wrap their heads around this, just what a man he was. But in Illinois, and in Tennessee, in Florida, in Mississippi, in the North and in the South, CT was there fighting to turn us back toward justice. A soldier who refused to raise his fist, a preacher's voice helped electrify a movement, a leader who inspired generations to join him in the ceaseless march of progress. CT didn't waste a single one of the days God granted him. But we all know that CT's spirit is going to continue to inspire us to fulfill his mission, a mission that remains unfinished. Our fight for racial justice to state the obvious is incomplete. And CT's memory now commissions all of us into service to finish the work of perfecting our union, to make sure every person can freely exercise their sacred right to vote, to bring us that much closer to our ideals of equity and justice for all. CT has earned his rest, joining in eternity his beloved wife, Octavia, and his eldest son, Cordy. And for as deep as we are in mourning of his loss, I can't help but think there must be a great celebration in heaven today, a reunion of good and faithful servants entering together into the joy of the Lord. Many of us continue to feel here on earth the hopefulness, the purpose that infused CT throughout his life. May God be with you all during these difficult days. We thank Vice President Biden for that beautiful, beautiful series of remarks on behalf of Dr. CT Vivian. They are heartfelt, but the part that I held on to the most was, well done, my good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the Lord. There is no doubt in any of our minds that it was a life well lived, a fight well won, won and a road well traveled. With that, we will conclude with the final video from Oprah Winfrey. I remember back in the 90s, doing a series of racial seminars with Reverend Vivian on The Oprah Show. What an impact he made on that audience of mostly white women at the time, gently yet passionately confronting them on their ignorances and their denial of racial inequality. We spent several days filming what would later be edited for airing, and it was a privilege to witness his wisdom teaching in action. In his presence, we were always learning more about our country, about ourselves, and what it means to stand for what is right. He was a giant for justice. Maya Angelou says in her poem, when great trees fall, that when great souls die, after a period, peace blooms slowly and always irregularly. Spaces fill with a kind of soothing electric vibration. Our senses restored, never to be the same, whisper to us. They existed. They existed. We can be, be and be better, for they existed. Reverend C.T. Vivian, we are better because he existed. Amen, amen, amen for that. Because 
He existed. We can be better. Because he existed, we have a right to vote. Because he existed, people can march in the streets today against social injustice. Because he existed and led an exemplary life before us, we can walk in love with no matter whom we come in contact with, knowing that we are all on the road for improvement. None is perfect, only Jesus Christ. We thank you, Oprah, for those beautiful remarks on behalf of C.T. Vivian. Quite often when we think of C.T., we see him as an activist, a reverend, a civil rights leader, most certainly a family man. And of course, all of this is true. But he was also an intellectual whose thoughts and ideas quite often were ahead of his time. I always thought of myself as an avid reader until one day I'm, I'm talking to my father-in-law and we're talking about books and I don't know if any of you all are familiar with his magic coat jacket, but I'm always amazed how he could open up his coat jacket and he pull almost anything out of it. You know, a coat jacket is only this big and he proceeded to pull out of his coat jacket a piece of paper that was this long and this wide and it was a list of the 100 books one should read before they leave this earth. Now this was in the early 90s, and my father-in-law shared with me he had already read over 75% of them, and in some cases he had read some of the books multiple times. Well, that's when I realized I really wasn't an avid reader, and I switched that to I enjoy reading. Dave spoke of his library, and if you have never encountered it or experienced it, it is truly something to behold. And it is not a library just for show. He has touched, been intimate with, read, and reread his entire library. And it truly has inspired me and continues to inspire me to run my race for reading. Will I catch him? I doubt it. But I thank him for leading the way. We know he enjoyed all genres of literature, but he had a particular affinity for poetry. His favorite poem being, If I Must Die, by Claude McKay. The next video you will see will provide a glimpse into CT's love of poetry. The video will be followed by a solo by Reverend Dr. Ozzie McKinney. I don't feel no ways tired. If we must die, let it not be like hogs hunted and pinned in an inglorious spot. While around us bark the uh, mad and hungry dogs making their mock at our cursed lot. If we must die, oh, let us die nobly so that our precious blood may not be shed in vain, that even the monsters we defy shall be constrained to honor us though dead. Oh, kinsmen, we must meet the common foe. Though far outnumbered, let us show us brave, and for their thousand blows deal one death blow. What though before us lie the open grave? Like men, we'll face the murderous, cowardly pack, pressed to the wall, dying but fighting back. That's good stuff, Doc. <laughs> <laughs> this far to leave me
me this far. I don't believe he's brought me this far. I don't believe he's brought me this far to leave me. I don't believe he's brought any of us this far to leave us. That was one of CT's favorite songs, one that he wanted sung today on purpose, intentional, not just with himself in mind, but with you in mind. We got work to do. It's not over until it's over. And I don't believe that God has brought us this far to leave us. Amen? Amen. Amen. What amazes me most about the Vivian family, and we've heard people talk about it already, is their capacity to love. If you ever saw CT and Octavia together, they literally held hands to her dying days as if they were school kids, just meeting each other, all in love. And their love didn't stop there. The love that they had for one another, they graciously shared equally with all seven of their children. And I want to say it was boundless in every way because it even extended to their in-laws. Now, I'm telling you guys, that's rare. That's real rare to be an in-law and to know that you are so loved by your in-laws. I mean, how often has one of us heard one of them say, particularly CT, I'm so glad you married my daughter. I'm so glad you married my son. Now, we did wonder at times, what's wrong with the daughter and the son? Because, <laughs> but, but we learned that they're beautiful people. Am I right, brother laws Yes, amen. <laughs> but CT was big. His heart was big. It was big enough to embrace the world but it was intimate enough to shape and nurture his family all the way down to his great, great, great grandchildren. With that, we will hear reflections from the family, beginning with Andre Thornton, his son-in-law, followed by his two sons, Mark Vivian and then Al Vivian. Now the same message goes, to the family. I don't want the evil eye from the second to the oldest daughter whose name I won't mention in public. So I need you guys to acknowledge the two to three minutes because I'm already in trouble for one of them. I know this. So I need you guys to help me out just a little bit because we got the good right reverend to the side here. Um, so after we have the reflections from his sons, the next voice you will hear will be that of the Reverend Dr. Gerald Durley, a staunch supporter of C.T. Vivian, his pastor, his friend, his confidant. Who better than Reverend Durley to eulogize this iconic man, the great Reverend Dr. C.T. Vivian? With that, Andre. Good afternoon, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Well, first of all, I want to thank everyone for being present to celebrate the home going of my father-in-law, Reverend Dr. C.T. Vivian. A given spirit with passion. When I think about my father-in-law, that's exactly what I think of him. A given spirit with passion. I guess you say, why? Well, I know we don't have all day, but number one, he gave time to all people from all walks of life. I don't care if you're from Alabama, Georgia, Tennessee, doesn't matter. He fought for voting rights, social justice, equality. He gave love. 
with passion. God knows he had to have that. And also, he gave wisdom. If you ever had a conversation, I guarantee you, by the end of that conversation, a life learned lesson. But for me, he gave me the greatest gift of all time. He gave me permission to marry his lovely daughter, Sharif. But it, hey, wait, the ending is the best part. Of course, he married us. And you know, during the ceremony, at the end of the ceremony, you know, you're supposed to say, you may kiss the bride. Oh, he forgot about that part. Oh, yeah. Sharice had to lean over and say, you forgot to say, kiss the bride. So he paused. He said, oh, go ahead and kiss him, kiss him, kiss him. <laughs> so, okay, okay. I remember that. So as years went by, you know, years went by, we started talking, and he looked me straight in the eye. He said, Doc, he called me Doc or something. Doc, I'm so glad you married my daughter. You know what I did? I paused. He's sitting on the edge of the seat waiting for a response. So I looked at him and winked, and I said, I know. He laughed and laughed, and he always said, Doc, that's some good stuff. That's some good stuff. But uh, my lovely mother-in-law, uh, Octavia, she the one who gave me stamp of approval. She told Cherise, oh, yeah, he, he'll be okay because he reminded me of the guys back at home in Pontiac, Michigan. And, you know, Dad, we, we're going to love you. We're going to continue to love you. We appreciate everything you've done. And the most important thing, this is my story, and I'm sticking to it. Good afternoon, doctors, doctors, and sister, sisters. <laughs> it's like there'll never be anybody like JT. The greatest pleasure I had was to call him dad. See, people know the great things he did, but they don't know him as dad. It goes beyond just to somebody you help on the street. There's a love he gives you, shows you, teaches you, shows you how to be a man. He didn't just tell you, all right, you need to do this, but he showed you. The greatest thing he showed me, whew, how to be a husband, how to love your wife, be there for her. If she's sick, be there for her. If you're going through something, that's somebody to talk to. That's who your main person to say your problems. That's the person you pull your strength from. She's there for you. And as long as you're there for her, there's no separation there. When God says you become one, what I saw in my parents, when God says, I will love her, when you make your vows, it's not a promise, it's a vow. As an old preacher told me years ago, he said, you might be able to break that promise with her, but you got to deal with God now. And when every time, to me, when my dad came home, I was like, yeah, dad's home. But one of the first things out of his mouth, baby, 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 baby. Well, yeah, baby, baby, baby. He ain't want to be bothered, but what my wife? <laughs> I love my kids, but my wife is my strength. You know, he, he's there for you. He showed his children day in, day out, how he's there for you. I remember one time, I was going to join this team. He said, no, you need to hold out a year. Get to, but, no. And they gave me some cheap equipment. And Dad called me up and said, uh, what's, what's better, Air Hammond 
or a water helmet. I said, well, it depends on what part of the country we're in. So he said, this is a football court. And uh, he said, okay. Then he called, what's better, butterfly shoulder pads or regular shoulder pads? And I said, well, if you're a receiver and a quarterback butterfly, I'm not. And I got off the phone with him. I'm like, oh, my God, he's about to buy me some equipment. I'm like, Mom, where's Dad? Tell him, don't buy me no equipment, okay? But he didn't want me to play yet. But yet he knew I loved the game so much. He wanted to make sure I was going to be taken care of and that he was going to make sure I was all right. Even what he didn't want me to do, but because he loved me, he's going to be there to protect me no matter what. When folks say, they have a father. Cool. But I had a dad. I had somebody. Whew, excuse me. When I needed advice. When I needed looking up to. When I needed just to hear somebody say, I love you. Even, what, a few days before he passed, dad had that firm grip. You shake that hand, you got a firm grip. And to me, that was a way of saying, I love you. I'm here for you. I got your back. So, Dad, all I can say is I love you. I miss you. Nothing better than you. Darn, Mark, I'm trying to hold it together. <sighs> Dilemma. How do you adequately say your final goodbye to the greatest person you've ever known? A person who has been your father, your mentor, your frat brother, your Morehouse brother, he is through one of his many honorary doctorates. Your friend, at one point your boss, and yet still your friend after having been your boss. The person who bestowed upon me my witty, my sons would say corny, sense of humor. The most daring, adventurous, audacious, epic, luckiest automobile driver I have ever known. <laughs> ever. Correction. The most Holy Ghost protected, angel covered, protected automobile driver the entire world has ever known. Dad. So dad was not that, he was not that, that shaky Mr. Magoo kind of driver. He was that need for speed kind of driver. Jeff Gordon, Mario Andretti, Danica Patrick, and Lewis Hamilton had nothing on dad. In fact, on a good day, dad would have given them a run for their money. I am sure of that. My sons have sat around saying, man, I wish I could have experienced what it would be like to ride in a car with granddad driving. They never got to have that experience because my wife would not have allowed that. They could not get in a car with him driving. <laughs> I digressed. Dad has counseled five U.S. presidents, He's sat with kings. He's traveled the world. He earned the Congressional, excuse me, the Presidential Medal of, of Freedom. He is a man that Martin Luther King Jr. called the greatest preacher he has ever heard. Let that sink in. 
Martin Luther King Jr., the man who delivered what has been called the greatest speech of the entire 20th century, said that dad was the greatest preacher he ever heard. But more importantly, he raised, before I talk about that, he married the love of his life. Married her and loved her, and they loved each other all the way to the end. For 54 years up until mom went home to be in heaven. He raised seven well-adjusted, well, six, my brother Mark. Let me just <laughs> love you, Mark. We always pick at each other. I'll say to Mark, I love you. He says, I like you too. <laughs> no matter how long I live, no matter whatever I accomplish, the greatest thing I will ever be known for is being the son of C.T. Vivian. Back to my dilemma. How do you say goodbye to the greatest person, your final goodbye, to the greatest person you've ever known? Turns out, my dilemma is not a dilemma. I don't have to say my final goodbye because this is not my final goodbye. We will see each other again in heaven. And as I enter, when that day comes, he, my mother, my big brother, Cordy, will greet me with open arms. So, Dad, till I see you again in heaven, I love you. Expressions. Expressions on each face, on each face, and I know, and I know that it's the presence of, of the, Lord. the Lord. You all know the song. Sing along with her. Sweet, sweet spirit. Sweet holy spirit. Sweet heavenly dove. Sweet heavenly. Vivian right now. Fill his power right now. Fill in this sanctuary. This is who C.T. was. A sweet, sweet, sweet spirit. We have been revived when we shall when we shall leave this place. Let the church say amen. Yes. I feel so good today. I sat there this morning. First, before I start, I would be simply remiss. I believe the mayor was here. I, I don't. Thank you so much for standing up for the city of Atlanta, Mayor Keisha Lance Bottom. We are in your corner because you are protecting the citizens. We elected you and you have made us so proud. You have made us proud in moments when you feel like doubt, when moments when you give up. Remember that there are those who will be continuously lifting you and your family up. It's not easy to lead in a time in which we live. I would also be remiss if I did not recognize the other children of the CT of the uh, civil rights. You want to turn this civil rights? With the other members whose fathers were civil rights legends, would you stand? Martin Luther King Jr., Elizabeth O'Malami from Karen Lowry. They're here supporting you all today. Where's Michael Jr. and Bond? Okay. 
in the colored section. CT, CT would get you up here, but he's not here with us today. As I sat there this morning, I wondered, what can I say? I had a list of things, and when different people came through, I kept checking them off. I said, nobody will make, nobody. And finally, it got down to about eight words. And I said, what could I talk about? And they tell me whenever you wonder what to talk about, you need to ask somebody. So I sent a note to, to Kyra. I said, Kyra, what should I talk about? She said, talk about how wonderful my dad was. I said, thank you, Kyra. Then I asked Jojo. I said, Jojo, what should I talk about? She said, talk about how he was as a father. I said, thank you. I turned to Mark, and I said, Mark, what should I talk about? He said, talk about my daddy when I left Mark Brown and went to Catawba College. And he said, go ahead on, boy. <laughs> I, I didn't know what to talk about, so I asked Al, what should I talk about? And he said, talk about the business that he left me. So now I knew what I should talk about. Oh, I forgot Denise. I said, Denise, what should I talk about? She said, talk about 15 minutes to sit down. We told you this is going to be a one-hour program. <laughs> we don't want to be in here all day, dearly. But it seemed like everybody that came on for me before me didn't hear the music that was playing. So, Denise, I, I will honor your wish and, do, and talk about the two things I have left. Let us go to God in prayer. Merciful and eternal, almighty God, we thank you for yet another opportunity to come into your sacred place, to thank you for a life that was well lived. We thank you, God, that in the midst of a pandemic that has changed our lives and changed our economic and educational system, that you've seen fit that in the midst of all of that, that you would bring forth and bring home one of your leaders so, God, we thank you for the life of CT. Now we ask that you would touch this, your servant. Breath and britches, breathe into him now, God, as he attempts to share a word about his good friend, his member, a man whom he loved so dearly. Let the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you, God, but certainly comforting to the family. We ask it all in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Pastor Williams, the shepherd of this great branch of Zion, let me on behalf of the family and the entire civil rights community thank you profusely, you and the members of Providence Missionary Baptist Church, for the warm and gracious way which you opened up your facility, even in the midst of all of the fear, you opened it. Plus, I want to give you credit. I have never met a person that could clean a pulpit so effectively. I feel safe now. You've done a great job, but seriously, thank you so much. We want to thank the Reverend Yana Vivian, Reverend Vivian. You have really moved the program along and we thank you so much with your insights and your wisdom. It was totally beneficial for the honoree today. I believe in all of my heart that we've been summoned to this very sacred place for this consecrated moment to reflect and to remember a man who never, ever, ever sought the limelight, a man who never wanted to be the center of attention. Today's honoree, in fact, shied away from the things that others would run to. He was not a me and my person. He was always y'all. Go ahead and do it. CT never wanted you to tell anything about him and what he did. The Reverend CT Vivian always gave the credit to others. I, I, I deeply feel that God today has purposely orchestrated this virtual worldwide worship service to highlight and give C.T. Vivian the rightful, earned, and deserved place as one of the greatest strategists in the civil rights movement. Today we honor 
C.T. Vivian. I have been in this city and you have a long time and many people have come and gone and justifiably so. We've honored Martin Luther King and we've honored Andrew Young and we've honored Joe Lowry and we've honored uh, John Lewis and C.T. was all the way back but I'm here to say worldwide this is C.T. Vivian's day. He is standing strong and we're here to give. Let's give him some noise. This is C.T. C.T., many times you might not have been left out. Many times they might have forgotten you, but you never said, look at me, look who I am. He said, give it to him, and he gave you that smile. That's who C.T. Vivian was. He never wanted you to say that. He stood boldly on his word. He knew who God was, and he knew that God would always give him the praise and the glory. Dr. Vivian always lifted up and elevated others. He felt that he was a mere catalyst in the human compound of bringing elements together. And Dr. C.T. Vivid always looked for the downtrodden people who face injustice and systemic racism. Today, C.T., you have proven one thing to young people and you need to know you don't need to be a star football player. You don't need to be a great basketball player or a singer. All you've got to do is be a good person, and good people don't finish last. C.T. was a good man, and now uh, today we honor him. Many people knew C.T. Vivian's name, but they didn't know who he really was. They knew his name, C.T. Like all of us, here today we were given an earthly label, a name, when we came kicking and screaming into a very treacherous world. How does Solomon define the importance of a name? In Proverbs, the 22nd chapter, in verses 1 and verses 4, it reads this way. Choose a good name over great riches. Being held in high esteem is better than silver and gold. Verse 4 reads this way. True humility and the fear of God lead to riches, honor, and a long life. Choose a good name over riches. And I thought about a word to share today, five simple words that I think epitomize and summarize our honoree, the Reverend Dr. C.T. Vivian. And I could simply say these five words that I call the title Say the benediction, the words that come to my mind after reading that passage, he had a good name. C.T. Vivian had a good name. We all have a name. Some of us like our name. Some of us don't like our name. Some of us change our name. Some of us go by nickname. But C.T. had a good name. We all got that label when we came into the earth. My name Gerald, what does it mean, Gerald? Mom and daddy worked hard to get the right name so our son would be unique, Gerald. And I looked up and I really feel unique when I found out that there were 2,300,000 Geralds. The name that they worked so assiduously to name me, they did that with CT. The name so that when somebody called you, you knew that you were supposed to respond to that name. And the parents go through books trying to find out, you parents know, what are we going to call Chautauqua, Shaniqua, trying to get something that no one else had, the uniqueness of a name. We struggle to get the right name so that everybody will know when my son or my daughter comes in, we gave them that name. Names merely identify us, but they never say who you really are. If you change your name today, would you change as a person? If you said, Dave, your name was Bob, and you said, I'm going to be Ann, what would change? So is the label that they put on you really your name? Solomon writes that a good name is better than great riches. Ninety-five years ago, they labeled a boy in Cordy Tyndall Vivian, and they, we called him C.T. I was knew him for many years. I didn't know his name was Cordy Tyndall. I just called him C.T., and they named him all of that time Cordy Tindall, and we call him C.T. But he had to choose another name. 
we always have the opportunity to choose the name, the real name, not the earthly label. CT had a good name, but what is a good name? A good name means that you are stable. A good name says that people can trust you and your word is your bond. Your good name says that people can believe in you when you have a good name. I know a lot of people with a lot of earthly labels and they, are, they don't have a really good name. What do people call you when you're not in their presence? I know what they call you when you're in their presence, but when you're not in presence, that's when they really talk about your name. They will call you, hi, Bobby, but when they go behind glory, that's when they tell you your real name. Your good name says people can believe. It implies that you are consistent, that your decision can be made in confidence when you have a good name. A good name speaks volumes about your character. A good name says that your character is impeccable. A good name reflects st stable moral ethical principles, which are the foundations of your life. A good name is really who you are, not the earthly label that we sit today with, but a good name. A good name precedes you before you walk into a room. Your earthly label simply announces that you're coming into the room. But when you're in the room, Don, that's when the name means a lot. Not what you are called. You are called by the name that you've been labeled. But that's not the good name. Reverend C.T. Vivian had a good name. When we get beyond the labels, we find the good name is always not only stable, but a good name is eternal. Great riches are fleeting. You get a lot of money here today and gone tomorrow. We rip, we run, we snatch, we lie, we grab, we cheat to get money. More and more money. Much riches, great riches. We think that we have it when we have all those riches to impress people that don't care a thing about you. Fix our hair, buy the grace there. Look what I'm driving. And guess what? As long as the party is on, as long as everybody's happy, they remember your name. But when you get on part times, when all the money is gone, when there's too much month at the end of the money, that's when you realize that they forget your name because your name was tied to what you have. CT did not worry about what he had. Dollar Tech, he never asked for an honorarium. He just said, when do you want me to come? How can I get there? He would walk down a hallway getting ready to speak. And if three children stopped him, CT would stop and start talking to those children and tell the rest of them, I'll, I'll be there in just a minute, Doc. I I'll be there. And he would take time because he had a good name. When you live what you have, your friends all know your name. Your friends might know where you live. Your friends might understand what gives you who you think you are, but riches will never make you dirty. Don't come in here talking about riches and gold and money. I need money to live. But if you have a good name, God says a good name is better than riches. Your name, but if you choose a good name, you will live long out. Good name will live long after you're alive. I know a lot of people, and you do too, that were millionaires in their lifetime and they've been gone for three to five to six years and when somebody brings them up they say oh yeah I remember her she was very wealthy she always dressed well and all of this that's her name but when you've been gone and they say oh I remember CT he was a man who came by my daughter's school I remember CT because when I was down he was standing there with a smile on his face. That's the name. C.T. had a good name. What I've found over the last several days, every time I turn on the television, I'm seeing John Lewis and Joe Laurie and C.T. Vivian. I sit here today and I heard all of the ministers get up before me and give a sermon about C.T. Vivian. And I listen, but I've learned one thing Everybody sitting here and all of you in television land, each one of you has a C.T. Vivian story. Everybody's got a C.T. Vivian story. And it's interesting about that story, they're all different, yet they're all the same. When C.T. met you, he was infectious. 
You thought you were talking to somebody, but he addicted you. Pretty soon you start coming back. What did he say? What did he mean by that? And C.T. had the word, he was so smooth with that little smile, always impeccably dressed, hair just right. And he would be sitting there, you'd think he's a little mealy mouth, but pretty soon C.T. would be talking to you. And C.T. didn't know how to go directly to a store. He went all the way around, over here and over there. And, and you're saying, and you might hear, say, well, I'm going to go pick up my daughter. That's right, that's right, sis. Uh, get your daughter. But let me just say this about that. And, and, and another thing I want to say, and here's, here's what I want to do. Okay, sis, well, it's good seeing you. Uh, but he, when he got back to the real point, it was always on point. Everybody had a C.T. Vivian story. When you get home tonight or tomorrow, think about the C.T. Vivian story. Mary Gurley, the great singer from Ebenezer Church, who sang for Dr. King, she called me. She said, Dirley, I just want to tell you something. And I didn't want to hear another C.T. story because they were trying to sneak in so I could speak their name today. But every now and then a story stands out. She said M.L. and C.T. came to march against the script company years ago. And M.L. had to leave town. But guess what? C.T. stood out there and kept, kept on talking for me. That was her C.T. story. A young man who had been in prison a long time called me and said, Dirley, let me tell you about C.T. When I got out of jail, I didn't know what I was going to do. That was his C.T. story. One day I came to a major convention and C.T. was walking around out in the lobby and I looked over and I said, that's C.T. Vivian. That's the famous C.T. Vivian. And he's just walking around like normal people. C.T. was normal. C.T. didn't need an a entourage. I don't know what these people need uh, uh, all these bodyguards for. If you need a bodyguard, you don't need to be in the profession you're in. God is your bodyguard. You don't need all these armor bearers. C.T. didn't have an armor bearer because C.T. was covered by God. He feared God. And this young man said, and I sat there and I said, Dr. Vivian, do you need some water? He said, young, young, <laughs> young, young man, let, let me get you some water. He went and bought, he said, he bought me back a bottle of water and we talked for over three hours. That was the greatest part. That was his C.T. story. C.T. would always made you feel like you were the only person in the room. He made you feel when he talked to you and he looked at you and that little finger would come up that you were exclusive. And you started feeling good about yourself. C.T. knows me. Until he said, yeah, <laughs> sis. You found out everybody was sis. You thought you were unique. C.T. had that way. He always said, you my pastor. And I thought, I said, how can a pastor, pastor, a pastor? But I felt I was good. My wife said, C.T. made me feel like a first lady. And I didn't even know what a first lady was. C.T. could make you believe something about yourself. One of the greatest compliments anybody can give to anyone, and C.T. knew it. You make me feel good about me when I'm with you. That's the good name that C.T. had. He will be, his name will be eternal because of all of the things that he did. Interesting thing about C.T., C.T., you heard about the smile. C.T. would smile, but he never ended with the smile. His smile started sm slow, then it got bigger. Pretty soon, it, you burst out into a laugh. And when C.T. started laughing, you had to laugh too. I remember one time we were talking, and he started laughing, and I started laughing, and I was laughing longer than him, and then I didn't even know what I was laughing at. I forgot to joke. I didn't even know it was a joke, but it was infectious. When you're down and lonely and the mountains are high and the valleys are low, you need somebody like C.T. to come alongside and say, you don't know what we've been through. You don't know where we're going. And he can lift you up without you knowing he's lifting you up. Some people will lift you up and send you a notice. Did you get my lift up? C.T. never did that. You would just say, C.T. could find the common good in everybody. And as somebody said, whether you were black, whether you were white, whether you were tall, whether you were gay, whether you were straight, whether you walk with a limp or you were a gigantic runner, C.T. found something in you. C.T. didn't look for your earthly label. C.T. looked for the good name in you. And when you put two good names together, that's a winning combination. His name will live through all of us who are here today. His name, your name, our names are not the earthly labels that they put upon us, but C.T.'s name will live through a program in Alabama called Visions. He believed that young people could do things. And all of you have read the bios and you've heard all of the TV 
announcements about CT's life. But that was a program out of his mind, out of caring, out of concern, out of compassion, out of insight, where he said, and that move, I want to work with young people and move to the Upward Bound program. Some could say, I never heard about CT founding the Upward Bound program because he didn't tell you. He's not going to tell you. But maybe some people that graduated from the Upward Bound program might tell you. Denise Morgan, great woman, a military person. Viola Davis, Oprah Winfrey, Angela Davis, Donna Brazil. These are all people that came through the Upward Bound program now that will keep C.T. Vivian's name alive. They all knew his great name and they all knew what was expected of him. C.T. Vivian was the most patient, impatient man I knew. He would be patient with you as long as you were doing right, as long as you were going along, but he was impatient with injustice. He was impatient with racism. He was impatient when we took other people down. And as John or somebody said earlier, none of us in this auditorium nor on them listening around the world can say CT ever said a negative, nasty thing about anybody. I pray to God that I could say that at my last home going. Because there's some folks I had to just blast. Hold it, unapologetically blast. CT would say, well, they've got a lot of growing to do. Let's pray for them. <laughs> hey, hey, Doc, you know, they, they really didn't mean what they said. <laughs> I say, CT, the man's a fool. <laughs> well, he's not a fool all the time. CT always found the good name. And every time he got knocked down, he got up stronger. CT was strong enough to join in with Dr. King and and, and bring all of the affiliates together under SCLC. Secrets, but now we're talking about inclusion. We're talking about all these companies around the world trying to break down the barriers between black and white and religious differences. CT founded the first program where he would sit people down and talk above racial lines and he would go into them and talk and make them feel uneasy. And Al carries the program on now, basic. But I was in the class of 95 with some of the most powerful people in this city, Mayor. They were sitting in there, and one man got up. He was a powerful doctor at Emory. He walked in. He thought he knew everything. He thought he was non-racist. He thought he was something. And C.T. had us all sit down. And C.T. turned over and looked at, at him, and he said, Hey, I want you to get out of here. You look like a racist. He said, Dr. Vivian, you don't know me. He said, You're a racist. Get out of here. So people start coming. He said, look at all of y'all defend this racist. You all must be. And people pretty soon were looking around. I'm sitting there saying, what's CT doing? He could challenge you, but he only challenged you to make you better in what you were doing. CT went on to train pastors and college deans. He was a dean down in there. Thank you, Don Rivers, for always being there. It was so easy. Thank you, Don Rivers. You see... You've got a lot of people that will say, but you've been there through thick and thin. You've been there through ups and downs. You've been there when me or even some of his children might not have been there. You sacrificed your life, and that was the secret to the movement. How much are you willing to sacrifice and how much are you willing to rear? So we all you, owe you a tremendous debt of gratitude. CT had a good name. Now he's finished. His good name is eternal. I often wonder, how do we get a good name? We get concerned about this earthly label. CT would want each of us to leave today beginning to work on the real name that you have. The name that when others call your label, they'll think about your real name. Some of us who run around jumping pews saying, oh, how I love Jesus, mean as snakes. Talking about folks, every now and then we ought to understand what CT stood for. One thing that stood out and has been said over and over and I had to strike it off my list three times. CT had a good name, but he married a woman with a great name. He married a woman with a great name. And when Octavia walked in the room, he knew and he said, I didn't know Octavia's name for the first two years. I just called her the wife. He said, Dearly, where's the wife? I said, who's the wife? The wife. 
Mark said he got baby, baby, baby. But the wife, he knew what it was like. He was a role model for my wife and I. We're in the 52 years of marriage now in a world that's coming apart. But because of a team and all of the women who were the foundation for those who were out there on the front line, the Kings and the Abernethys and the Williams and all of the others, it was the women who were standing there strong, taking care of the children and talking about what it meant. They had good names because they knew God and they knew that what they were doing was just as important as those out on the front. And sometimes the children had to sacrifice, the wives had to sacrifice, but because they did, they, they, they brought us to this point now in America. So we cannot negate that. She had a good name. She was determined and resolute and she supported her. But the real key is not just in Proverbs 21.1, but in Proverbs 22.4, 20, it said that when you humble yourself and when you fear God, he will give you riches, honor, and a long life. We've come today to celebrate a man who's rich. Oh, George, his bank account might not be written that he's got so much in his bank account in his name, but his name is written on the Lamb's Book of Life. With all the funds that he ever needs, all he's got to do is call on God. And when he called on God, the riches began to flow. He's been honored by kings and ambassadors all over the world, honored. But now today, only a few days from his 96th birthday, God has given him a long life. He is rich. He has been honored, and now he's received a life. And I say today on behalf of C.T. Vivian, if you want to honor that long life, do what C.T. did when he stood there on the courts there in Dallas. We have a moral and an ethical obligation today all over this land. If this body has gone to where it's going, then we can keep it alive we can keep the good name alive by going out and voting. That's what CT would want. He would want us to get up and get out and register and vote and change the nation. Don't shy from that. CT was one that said, I, my good name is that I said, I want you to vote. I want you to love your neighbors. I want you to understand that even though I've gone now, I'm happy. Excuse me, I'll tell you, I'll move, 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 move the chair over there. Hey, sis, how you doing? Hey, Co hey, hey, Corey, hey, Doc. CT, his name is eternal because God, God gave him a good name, and we keep that good name alive by voting. They say in the mortuary business that we all have five senses. We have the sense of touch. We have the sense of sight. We have the sense of, of smell and taste. But they say when this earthly tabernacle has gone, there is one sense left, and that's the sense of hearing. And I believe that even though this body has not been placed to rest, I think right now in the name of Jesus Christ on this great day, we ought to stand and give C.T. Vivian what his due is, and he can hear it. Give him his roses now. CT, this is for you. This is your time. Look at the people applauding in this sanctuary. Look at the people up in Washington, D.C. applauding. Look at the people down there in Mississippi and Alabama. CT Vivian, he had a good name. If he was a blessing to you, shout his name. CT, God bless you. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like seas 
Though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ. It is well, it is well, it is well with our souls. We have come to celebrate a gentle giant, and indeed we did, no doubt about it. I think we have all left with our hearts full, being reminded that his life lives on. He has a good name, and that good name, C.T. Vivian, is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, and therefore it is well. It is well with his soul. Before we conclude today's service, I want to make sure I acknowledge a family and a representative of that family who is here with us today, and that is John Miles Lewis. If you'll stand for us, please. His father, of course, is John Lewis. We honor that family. Your dad was on the front line for justice long before people in this room were even thinking about it. He gave his life tirelessly, effortlessly, not just then, but his entire life. And we are grateful for you, your family, and our hearts are with you during this difficult time. You remain in our prayers. We love you all. We're grateful for you guys. And thank you for honoring us by being here. Thank you. Again, just going back, I said it earlier, you know, you always see infighting amongst organizations, but the people of the Civil Rights Movement and their children, there was such a bond with them. You think about this, we have three siblings of great leaders who've lost somebody this year who are here, and that's amazing. It's truly amazing. It's a testament of the love and the goodness of God that they depended upon and relied upon. It's their driving force. It's what they led with. It's what we should lead with. And with that, I like to make acknowledgments. Following the loss of our beloved Reverend Dr. C.T. Vivian, the family is grateful for all of God's blessings during this difficult time, especially the many heartwarming expressions of love and support from friends, from neighbors, from the community, and of course, beyond. 
Your thoughtfulness and prayers provided a great source of strength and comfort in this time of bereavement. We in particular want to take, thank each organization that provided a proclamation which speaks to the impact CT had on humanity. The family wishes to give our greatest appreciation to the life and legacy of our father by acknowledging those who gave donations to his foundation and for his library and archives. They are as follows, Bank of America, Chick-fil-A, the Coca-Cola Company, Georgia Pacific, the Home Depot, Kaiser Permanente, Truist, UPS, WSB TV, and I do believe there were two editions. I don't want to leave anybody out. Bear with me. CBS 46 and Andrea Boone City Council. Again, the family says thank you for your support, not just now, but your continued support through prayers, phone calls, thoughts, and love as the days go on. With that, I'll return the service to Reverend Williams. Amen. Brothers and sisters, have we not worshiped the Lord and celebrated the life of this great man, the Reverend Dr. C.T. Vivian? To all of the many leaders who are here, to all of the many family members who are here in the sanctuary, and to all of our brothers and sisters all across the world who are worshiping with us, we are so grateful and so thankful. I've been informed that President Kausa of the Sikhs is here, and I thank you so much for your presence and support of this family. Amen. At this time, would all who are not the family please stand? At every homegoing celebration, I point out that everyone calls family members in the season of a homegoing. Everyone brings food by the family's house. Everyone sends emails and text messages and checks in on them. The question is, who is going to check on the Vivian family a week from now, a month from now, six months from now? Who is going to check on the Lowry family, the Lewis family, the Vivian family, and the King family? As much as you have shown your love by being present here today, as much as you have shown your love by streaming with us, show that love by continuing to check on these families because they always checked on us and took care of us. Listen to these instructions. In just a moment, I'm going to offer the benediction. Following the benediction, the clergy are going to exit the pulpit to my right, cross in front of Dr. Vivian to my left, and we're going to exit up that aisle right there. I will ask that you would stand and hold in place. At that time, the service will be in the hands of Willie Watkins Funeral Home, and they will direct the recessional for who is to follow in order as we exit the church this way, going down to Benjamin E. Mays Drive. Please allow the funeral home to give you your instructions so that you know when to move. Once you get outside, after Dr. Vivian is placed, we ask that you move expeditiously to your cars and join us for the interment at Westview Cemetery. To the family of Dr. Vivian, I will tell you like I tell every family at a homegoing celebration. The Bible does not tell you how to grieve. The Bible simply says in the final chapter of Deuteronomy that you must grieve. So in the coming days, weeks, and months, you do whatever you have to do to grieve the loss of Dr. Vivian. But do not grieve like a people who have no hope. Your father knew the Lord. And that same faith that was in him is also in you. Brothers and sisters, the benediction is a blessing. It is a gift. It is my gift to you. And when someone gives you a gift, please don't close your eyes and look down, but look me right in my eye. May the Lord bless you. 
And may the Lord keep you. May the Lord reach you. And may the Lord teach you all the days of your life. And now, even now, may the grace of God and the sweet communion of God's Holy Spirit may it rest and rule and abide with you and with you and with all of you, both henceforth now and forevermore. And all of God's children who love the Lord and who love Dr. Vivian, we all said together, amen. One day when the glory comes, I will be free, I will be free, oh, one day when the race is won, I will be free, I will be free, I'll say glory, glory. Glory, 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 glory. One day when the glory comes, it will be ours, it will be ours, oh, one day. When the war is won, we will be sure, we will be sure, we'll say glory, 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 we'll shout glory, glory. When the war is over, victory has been won. He fought until the finish, and now this all done. We'll cry glory, oh glory, glory, glory. Yeah, one day, when the glory comes, be free I will be free oh one day when the race is won